everyone. Thank you for being here today. And uh, we really appreciate the fact that you are here for something slightly different from our ordinary Sunday entertainments, which usually happen to be musical. But today we thought it would be nice to invite um, a couple of really wonderful writers uh, in to talk about their work and read from their work. Um, we were just reviewing how this came about, which is that I've known Simon for quite a long time. I had never met Lucas, but Simon suggested that Lucas contact me because he'd just written a book of poems, which I read and I loved. And then we decided that wouldn't it be nice to have these two longtime friends out to do some reading and to talk about their friendship and to just generally spend a little time with us. So I'll tell you a couple of things about both of them. Um, Simon Van Bui uh, is the best-selling author of 10 books of fiction for children and adults, along with three anthologies of philosophy. His short story collection, which was titled Love Begins in Winter, won the prestigious Frank, uh, 2009 Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award. And his books have been translated into many languages and optioned for film. Simon has also written for the New York Times, the Financial Times, NPR, and the BBC. And in 2013, he founded Writers for Children, a project which helps young people build confidence in their story, storytelling abilities through annual awards. Simon lectures part-time at the School of Visual Arts in New York City, and he serves his community as an auxiliary police officer. <laughs> he enjoys building robots, modern <coughs> planes, and off-road vehicles, which he likes to crash, as he tells me, hmm. and has an impressive umbrella collection. Well, he is from raised in rural Wales and in England. Simon hmm. currently lives in Brooklyn, and he spends time in Miami with his wife, Christina, his daughter, Madeline, robot rabbi, rabbit boy, and a fully grown sheep. Please welcome Simon Van Bui. Our second guest, <laughs> whom I just had the pleasure of meeting, is Lucas Hunt, who grew up the son of an oil well driller in Iowa, and dropped, after dropping out of college, spent time in Mexico and in Europe before attending the undergraduate Iowa Poetry Writers Workshop. He later studied in the MFA program at Southampton College at LIU, and his debut collection of poetry, titled Lies, was published to critical acclaim, followed by Light on the Concrete and Iowa, the first in a five-book series that traces the poet, poet's progress to places of inspiration in an epic fashion. His most recent volume is titled The Hamptons. It was published this year, and in the future, we can look forward to New York, Paris, and Rome. Lucas Hunt's work has been published in numerous publications, including the New York Times, and he received the John Steinbeck Award for Poetry. Along the way, he has worked on a pig farm, washed semi-tractor -trail trailer trucks, bartended at an American Legion Hall, and served as a park ranger. He is the president of Hunt Auctioneers and has helped raise millions of dollars and awareness for nonprofit organizations, and also serves on the board for the Poetry Society of New York. Please welcome Lucas Hunt. Thanks, Betty. Are you turned on? Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, nice to see everyone. And today we're going to talk a little about uh, our friendship uh, and how it influenced our works. And we're going to read uh, from our books while we have you cornered. <laughs> Um, and then we'll take questions. You can ask us anything at all, uh, as long as it's not about politics. Um, <laughs> um, and so, Luke, would you like to read? Sure. 
I'll jump in with uh, my new book, Hamptons, which came out this summer, and uh, starts off with a quote from The Great Gatsby. Um, Simon and I studied The Great Gatsby at Southampton College, and uh, whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, he told me, just remember that all the people in this world haven't had the advantages that you've had. Um, kicks off the book, and that for me, when I first came to the Hamptons uh, from Iowa, I saw there were a lot of advantages here that I didn't have growing up. And uh, I think this book sets out to have fun with some of those advantages, playfully. So I'll start off with the first real poem in the book. Uh, it's called Memorial Day. And I think the structure of this book is, I try to make summer last forever. You know? And so I, I wrote this book, which seems like one summer, uh, but it actually took probably about 15 summers, and then just compounding that in one experience. So yeah, I'll start off with uh, the first poem, it's Memorial Day. The question of what to wear is always there. Evening begins, like any other day, a savage ache for leisure. So let's offend the usual thing. A car down wooded lane, mansions of green and white. The sun sings in waves, oysters on silver trays, iced buckets of champagne. Tradition is alive. A few died or committed suicide. The season brings new faces. High on a patio, lips curl for the first of many pictures of summer people. And I meant that to be nonchalant and serious at the same time, and I think that tends to be the kind of tone in here. Um, this one, I lived in Hampton Bays, and I, I love that because I grew up in working class in the Nile. And uh, this was a ritual that I, I did with some friends there, probably once a month. Um, we had steak at this little cottage. Um, but calling it a cottage is glorifying it. It was a shack. And we had a, a steak night there. Once a... Uh, a month, and so I wrote this poem, Steak Night at the Shack. You may wonder why we are here to remember, gather round to watch the pallets burn, men just off work, drinking beer in plastic chairs, smoking cigars and talking about fish piled on a boat at sea. A distant dog barks as Murphy explains how the butcher cut the meat, thick and true. Pound for pound, it's prime beef, he says. We are men and will eat like men. But before potatoes are seasoned and sliced, before romaine, mushrooms, tomatoes, peppers get thrown together, before shrimp cocktail, horseradish sauce, and hot garlic bread, before the cork pops, games commence. Horseshoes and darts with a simple system of bats. Classic rock blasts from the driveway, songs of love that is new as the sunset glows amid leafless trees. To fishermen and electricians who share their catch with friends, who String the yard with lights so our games can go all night. There have been parties here. The police were called. No one was hurt. Now the fire is ten feet high, and summer seems to return, as aromas of dinner drift out the kitchen. And one at, one at a time, we head inside to wash our hands and crack new cans of beer, clear, wiped, and set the table with bowls of pilaf, creamy spinach, and sautéed onions to pile on empty plates. Finally. Without ceremony. The large glass platter of steaming steaks arrives fresh from the grill, and Mel forks one out to each of us and then sits down. No one says the grace if the cost of life has been implied. We are men and will eat like men. So, uh, let's. So, turn back over. About um, 26, 27 years ago, uh, we, I joined this drinking club um, called University, you may have heard of it, and uh, where you know you, you would spend most of your time socializing and enjoying the freedom of not being around people telling you what to do. And again, uh, then now and again you read a book. And, um, and one night, if a, then when you're young it was early, but it was probably about two o'clock in the morning. Now I'm in bed by, by nine o'clock. Um, 
And uh, I was standing outside the university center, smoking a cigarette. Turns out that's not very good for you. Uh, but in youth, we're free, right? So uh, I was smoking, and I, I saw this man drifting around. I thought he was homeless at first. He was in his grandfather's World War II coat, and he had on big boots. And uh, he came over and asked me for a, a match. So I, I gave him a match, and we sort of smoked in silence. And then he disappeared. He drifted off into the night. Um, a week later, there was uh, um, controversy at the university because somebody had, on their dorm room wall, had recreated a painting by Picasso called uh, the Demoiselle d'Avignon, naked Spanish women, women eating breakfast. It's probably normal in the mountains. But um, he recreated it, and the janitorial staff thought it was vulgar, and the student should, be, should place disciplinary action. And then the art department said, well, you know, students want to copy paintings by Picasso, it's fine. Um, so it was front page of the student newspaper, and I thought, this is somebody I think I'd like. <laughs> so um, I went to, uh, found the dorm room, uh, snuck past security, went up in the elevator, and I knock on this door, and this person in boxer shorts, cowboy boots, a cowboy hat, that's it, holding a, a glass full of tea, opens the door with a cigarette in his mouth, it was him, the smoking man in the World War II coat. And I was like, it's you. And he said, I don't think he recognized me, but, um, and since then we became very, very good friends. Yeah, we took a long walk that night. We started talking, we couldn't stop talking. You can mm -hmm. see that's still our habit. Uh, but we took a long walk that night, and Simon lived off campus, and the weather was similar. And we just got to know each other, and it was a moment where I thought, I think this guy's my soulmate, you know? And I don't know where that came from, but it was just like, we're gonna be around for a long time, so I wanted to know what he wanted to do. Like, what's this guy up to? Because we were just, heck, I was 20. And he was 22. So, That's weren't you? No, no. Um, I might mean, have looked 22. Yeah. I was, I was young. <laughs> <laughs> but I think very clearly, the, the, the thing he wanted to do was right. And uh, while other students were going to class um, and socializing, he was actually locking himself in his room uh, after classes and just writing for like five hours. Which meant I had to leave the university at the end of the semester, yeah. which is fine. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah. but um, it's interesting when you, you meet somebody and that they remember you when you were a teenager. I don't know if you know anyone like that uh, who remembers you, and they remember uh, all your impulsiveness and uh, bad decisions that you made that they tried to talk you out of. Um, and, um, and then, you know, later on, decades later, you know, we both had to make calls to each other to say, you know, something happened and I, I need you here now. And to have that kind of friendship, I think, is, is quite um, unique. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> all the books I write, I suppose, um, are a kind of, are a tribute to all the people I've met along the way who have been influential because they, they cared enough to share themselves. So there's people in this room like that, and there's people in the, who are not in this room, but they are in this room too, because um, you know we all have such an effect on each other. Um, so I always feel like even though there are empty chairs, for me those chairs are filled with faces. Um, and I write mostly about that, the interconnectivity of people. So we're all links in the chain, but we can't see the other links. But, you know, they're there holding us in place. So I'm actually going to ask Pat to pass me a book. Um, maybe The Illusion of Separateness, if that's it. The Illusion of Separateness. Thank you. Um, so this book has um, got the idea, my wife is um, Jewish, but she's, she's into Buddhism. And so she leaves all these things lying around, and uh, you know, as I'm heading to the Tamil bath or something, I pick something up. And I picked up this magazine, and it talked about, uh, there was an article on, um, on uh, separateness, and the illusion of separateness. And the quote started the article was, we are here to awaken from the illusion of our separateness. Um, and scientifically, of course, that makes sense, because 
uh, everything's recycled, energy is recycled. Um, and so I thought, hmm, that might be a good idea for a book. And that coincided with um, looking at the paintings of Bruegel the Elder. Uh, and they're very strange. They're from, I think, the 16th century. And they're these tiny little weird, strange people with funny little porridge faces. And you can't, there's no real main character in his paintings. Even Jesus is just a little speck among many specks. And you realize that Charlie Chaplin was right, that close up human life is tragic. But from a distance, it's funny. Um, anyway, I'll read a little from this book. Part of it is set in Amagansett. Anecdote while he finds this. Thank you. When we were talking that first night on the long walk, uh, one of the coincidences among many others that we found was that we were both recruited by the same college to play football uh, in the Midwest, uh, a college called Co. Uh, in my home state of Iowa. And we thought, what's the chances of that? We were walking along the street here in Wales, and um, we were both asked to play football. You know, said no to it. But we could have met there too, so that there were all these seeming coincidences and uh, points that it made it feel like uh, our lives weren't so different, you know, that we weren't meant to meet. Um, yeah, that's a very good, very interesting thing, yeah. that we would have met there. Um, hopefully we would have got along, yeah. um, as well as we do now. Um, when I was 11, we learned that my condition is permanent. Doctors at a hospital on Park Avenue showed my parents thin squares of plastic that proved it. We were all disappointed, and even though my body was no different, it felt different, as though part of me had died, a part of me strangled by a sentence of bad news. Then we left the hospital and went to St. Ambrose on Madison Avenue. The waiter brought gelato, but I couldn't eat. It would take time for hope to melt. Finally, my father said, we were happy before, and nothing has actually changed. I could tell he didn't believe it, and I wanted to scream. I was wearing a velvet blazer, and one of the doctors had said I looked elegant. I told him I was named after Amelia Earhart, and when he didn't answer, I knew it was bad news. I could tell everyone in St. Ambrose was looking at me. I needed the restroom, and my legs were cold. It was raining. People came in shaking their umbrellas. We live in the Hamptons year round, and our house is by the sea. It often rains suddenly, and my mother runs upstairs to open the window in my room. She sits with me on the bed. It's something we've always done. Sometimes her hands smell like dinner. Sometimes I inhale the scent of her makeup, as though trying to lift the veil of who my mother is. Rain says everything we cannot say to one another. It's an ancient sound that willed all life into being, but fell so long upon nothing. Even though I'm almost 27, my mother still puts flowers in my room. She arranges them in a heavy vase that sits on my dresser next to the plastic model of a B-24 bomber that my grandfather John flew in World War II. The scent of the flowers lingers for a few days as they're waiting for an answer. Tonight I have a date which is big news in our house. He's picking me up at six o'clock, but I feel like I'm already with him, sitting quietly in his warm truck. I've imagined it. The radio is on, but no. We're somewhere in Psychoponic, or maybe he's driven to Southampton. It's too cold for the beach, so we sit in the parking lot and talk. He wants to know what it's like being blind. I confess the smooth coolness of the window but the idea of glass is something beautiful and unknown. I ask him to tell me about stars, but what I really want is to be kissed. Winter evenings out here are quiet. The air smells of wood smoke and seawater. The Golden Pear Cafe fills up early with retired bankers and once famous artists who sit alone by the window, turning the pages of morning. Most people remember the Hamptons as an unbroken summer the place of sandwiches and laughter, hot weather, things lost on the beach. In summer, I sleep with my windows open. 
night holds my body in its mouth. In this second darkness, my desire flings itself upon a world of closed eyes. So that character, Amelia, is, um, obviously she's, she's been blind since birth. And uh, researching for that character was interesting because I finally got to buy and wear women's clothes. Um, because she would buy based on fabric, the touch of the fabric, the feel of it. So I had to buy them in my size. And um, so when my daughter would come home from school, um, and I'd be wearing a dress, and she'd say, oh, what book are you working on now? Um, <laughs> And, uh, and uh, anyway, uh, I went to Century 21, which is a discount um, clothing shop on Long Island. And, um, and then I kept them in the closet and I bought perfume. So I really was able to create a character, uh, you know, from, you know, on a really visceral level. So writers are crazy, and I knew that from the beginning. Because they have a vision, and they're passionate, and they pursue it without maybe reason. They go for it. I think when Simon and I met, we bonded on the fact that we we're both going to pursue our craziness. Mm -hmm. And we thought, you know, if you're going to do something that maybe seems crazy to other people, it helps to have support and it helps to have a friend. So we promised to each other to support the other in that endeavor, to become a writer, in my case, an artist, poet, whatever it was going to be. And that was the, the promise, and that was the bond of our friendship. That was the birth of it. I think that's why we're still friends, because um, no matter what he does, I know he's, he's going for it. I could murder someone, he'd still be <laughs> I'd visit him. But, but it's the idea of um, there's so much that happens in our lives that, is, that maybe seems unreasonable at one point in time. When I say crazy, I mean in the best way. I mean it very affectionately. Because to spend your life trying to write poetry here. In the early stages of a, of a career trying to publish fiction, it's very difficult, you know, especially when you think about the economic pressures. So um, we had the opportunity to, after being pen pals, we, uh, I studied in England for a year, went back to America, and um, we wrote for three, four, Five years, we wrote each other letters. Is this a bad time to tell you I can't read your writing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can. <laughs> you can. Uh, so we spent, yeah, it was 20, it was four years of, of writing each other letters. And I would say monthly or every, one every two months, you know. Um, this was like right before the email era came in. Mm -hmm. And so, that was how we stayed in touch. You know, we spoke on the phone a little bit. I think we saw each other about once a year. But one day I was in um, Iowa City uh, in a fit because I wanted to be a poet, but I was studying at university as a journalist and writing for a newspaper. And it was hard work, and I just wanted to write poems. Um, but I needed to pay for tuition. And I got a call, and it was Simon. He said, uh, I've got a proposition for you, uh, but you have to answer yes or no now. And uh, all right, all right, I'll take the terms. Um, he said, if you're willing to move to New York, I'll help you. Um, and I can get you, you know, I can help you move the process, like getting matriculated to the college that I'm studying in, because he'd moved from England to study at Southampton College and graduate school. And so I thought about it, and I thought, this is my opportunity to leave Iowa, uh, which was my lifelong dream. And uh, it didn't take me too long, you know. But I knew it was going to be, it was the life-changing moment like, that I'd kind of been waiting for, but I was terrified of doing. And so I said, yes, I'll, I'll go for it. And so I went down to the bank. I'd been saving up money. And they said, um, I said, I'd like to withdraw all my money. And they said, what do you want, travel? You're going to New York? You want traveler's checks? I said, no, I want 20s. I want to have two thick stacks in my pockets so I feel like, you know, and they were like, you're insane, you're crazy, but that, I moved to New York like that and drove out a little bit. I remember the car that he drove out was a Chevy Chevette. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, the parking, something was wrong with the brakes, so whenever he stopped, he quickly had to put bricks under the wheels to stop the car rolling away. <laughs> and, $400 uh, car. And then he went to a shop in Hampton Bay to get the car repaired, and I think they charged him $3,000. And he only paid $400 for the car. Yeah. So from then on, I thought, we'll go to Brooklyn. 
Um, but um, when he when he moved out, it was uh, I think it was um, the way that he'd helped me come to the U.S. by just inspiring me to leave Britain. Um, you know, then he came to New York, a land of suntans, fifteen dollar sandwiches. <laughs> It was the best decision I ever made, and we got to study together. It was kind of a dream come true, because we met at college, undergrad, and then uh, we got to spend some time in graduate school, and really in, in a more peaceful place. At the same time, we were both struggling to face the facts that we had chosen to be writers. Mm -hmm. uh, Which I think it helped, it helped that we both grew up in rural farming communities where all we had was friendship and love, if you cultivated it. Mm. Um, and you know, the idea of, in my family, becoming anything other than a farmer or a, uh, a plumber or an electrician, which is a, they're good jobs, you know, but the idea of becoming a writer, my parents thought it was a terrific idea. They didn't know any writers. They thought, well, it sounds like you'll have to go to London. And I visited London more as an American, visiting the UK than I did as a child. Um, and I think that um, because we didn't grow up around a lot of, um, you know, material wealth for us, just having food and a place to live and friendship and being able to go out and have a drink now and then, for us that was all we really wanted from life. Um, yeah. yeah, kind of an honest living but especially time to write. Yeah, I mean a lot of living in New York now for 20 years in the city, a lot of people, what they call friendship is actually, I think, network. It's not friendship. For me, friendship is when it hurts. You know, when it is difficult to, to do something for someone. It is an imposition. And it is extremely inconvenient, but you do it anyway. And to me, that's friendship. I would say things to Simon, like, I'm, I'm glad we're friends. And he would say, uh, well, you know, every bond is a bond to sorrow. Did I say that? Yeah. I didn't mean that. <laughs> I don't remember saying that. Yeah. English can be grim in that <laughs> cheery way. Are you sure I didn't say every bond is a bond to Santa? Um, <laughs> um, yeah. And Madeline's, um, sorry, Luke's been a great uncle to my daughter. Um, and uh, you know, he's watched her grow up. And, um, and uh, when, for a while I was a, a single parent and we went to France on holiday together. You know, and she would, I, she would hold my hand and he would hold her hand and people would go like this. <laughs> I mean, like, we, we would wonder why they were. Uh, this, uh, um, would you like to read? Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 place is so important to me, and I feel like I wouldn't be the writer that I am for having moved out here. Um, coming to the Hamptons for me saved my life. I felt like being by the ocean after living in a landlocked place for the um, first 20 four years of my life, I felt I'd been delivered. I grew up in a kind of parochial small town, farming town, um, where the dominant sort of aesthetic was Lutheranism, which was, no, not, yeah, it was not, <laughs> <laughs> not Luciferism, okay. Lutheranism, it, it is. Um, but, um, so coming to the Hamptons, I was exposed to so many new things, new thoughts, new ideas, people, but poetry seemed acceptable here, um, even if it wasn't this like, viable and it wasn't going to be paid, paying, um, it seemed acceptable, so I felt very free and liberated um, to be here and, and just kind of dove in it, and this book for me really took 15 years to write, because um, you're, you're sort of waiting for that thing that inspires you, or that true thing that's meaningful and beautiful, and so I thought I'd read something that kind of moves around a little bit to give you more of a sense of movement, um, and this is called Montauk et al. Um, it's for a friend of mine named Jeff, who was obsessed with the Latin phrase et al. And he didn't know what it meant, but he, he said it sounds very good. And I said, well, I wrote this poem, I've written this poem Montauk, you know, it's inspired by our journeys or something. And he said, well, could you call it Montauk et al? <laughs> I'm like, all right, you know, I think it simply means and everything or all of that. But uh, this is a, a kind of an ode to summer as well. Does love change you? You can't change. Summer people here for the season, watering wind, sun on skin. 
I don't care if you say pink is the blue sky. Planes going out come in. What miracles. We bike a sandy lane and reach the end without falling down. At the dirt road, Jeff plays our song. I've been sleeping for too long, hibernating from your love. Montauk sunrise over the stink of shellfish. Harbor seagulls ride above the surf lodge. Sunset lovers saw Leon Bridges sing, Baby, 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 I'm coming home. And clouds sway like horseshoes and things get away. So we cross Main Street for juice and beer, back doors, gravel alleys, motel parking lots, worn dirt path in the grass, bodies bent in waves, drunk crying girls, supposedly, supposedly a happy place. Beach blankets by the sloppy tuna, rainbow kites and lifeguards high on stands. Little balls paddled back and forth to casual conversations. Dancing on the sand, a song becomes the story of our moment. Easter Island motels line the shore like totems, and there's a pool to rinse off, the beach house for cold drinks. And barely wearing any clothes, we look for boots, bracelets from Latin America, then go to see the sunset at one talking. The sun just went behind mountainous clouds. It's the start of a new nightlife. So we shower, cut the collar off a dress shirt, make it a strap collar. Would you prefer tequila, vodka, whiskey? Let's take hits. The car will be here in five minutes. Off to rush liners. Pencil on the pavement. See above a ball field. Beer can in the driveway. Arrow sign past tombstone benches. A concrete fountain. Grass cracked asphalt. Looks like someone did donuts in the parking lot. The trees move, a bicycle does not. The stars replace the fish, and your arms are a marble tomb, the language of love below the waves. All that's left of summer is one dream song or another. A patient breeze caresses leafless trees, a glorious flag afloat outside the club. It's time to go. Love is life, is love now. Let's do it all again. I think the only time we ever argued was when we tried living together. Ah. <laughs> because I go to bed at 9 o'clock, and he'd come back at midnight and proceed to cook a five-course gourmet meal, <laughs> which he would then eat at about 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, and then demand you payment for groceries the next day. Um, he's also the only person I've ever known who can trespass in the middle of the night on the Pollock Estate in Springs and never once get a tick. <laughs> um, so um, I'll read uh, a little bit from uh, this same book. And, uh, and then, if anyone has questions, you know, feel free to, um, to ask. That means think of a question now, uh, if you want to. I'll add one thing before you read. So we moved here. We started careers. Simon became a professor and worked on books. Um, I did various jobs and worked on poems. Uh, and then one lucky day, uh, I lost my job, actually. And I called Simon and I was worried. I said, I lost my job. Uh, what do I do? He said, well, you can't just keep doing what you've been doing. You need a real career. And um, I said, well, what should I do? And he said, well, why don't you become a literary agent? <laughs> and uh, I thought, that's impossible. How, how do you do that? And then he said, well, there's a newspaper application. Just have here. Stuff. Yeah, Help section. right here. Like, call them up and see. And, uh, you know, and my old boss happens to be here. But um, I got a job as a literary agent. And uh, they said, well, do you have any clients? Are you going to help us sell some books? And um, Simon was like, I got a book. Maybe it's good for you. So coincidentally, um, we got to work together on our literary careers and uh, sell many of his books in many languages together and travel um, to China. So as a, um, as a brother, but also kind of as like a uncle or someone who gets to help share work, I got to have a first-hand experience with the person that I love, but also with the work that I really always loved in his writing. So every time he reads or every time he pick, picks up a book, know how much work it took, and also uh, how lucky and special it is that the book. Mm -hmm. so, yeah.
when we travelled to China together um, to, to throw Bogotov, I gave up drinking in, uh, in 1999, and uh, and uh, Luke did, did not. And, uh, and um, but he's distilled his uh, appreciation now into you know fine wines and fine American beers and fine European beers and fine uh, American wines and fine Russian spirits and fine Scottish. So, you know, just a few things. Um, <laughs> but when we went to China, a lot of the, the Chinese uh, business people, they're constantly drinking and toasting. So as I didn't drink, Luke very generously uh, offered to, uh, to have my share. Yeah. <laughs> Two for one. <laughs> yeah. So that worked out pretty well. Um, and then when they said, you know, would you like to go up to a nightclub, Luke was happy to go. While I went home to bed, you know, he was doing work. Right. The New York Times crossword. Yeah. Um, so this is a. This book is actually inspired by my wife's um, grandfather, who was shot down in World War II, and he jumped out of the airplane into total darkness. He would never parachuted before. And uh, he thought to himself, as he was jumping out, anything that happens to me from this moment on is an encore. Uh, and he became quite a famous DJ uh, sportscaster in the 1950s and 60s. Um, he, had, uh, he, took on a, uh, he took on an assistant who he thought had promised, who was Ted Koppel. Um, so um, he jumped out of the airplane, and uh, he made it to the ground uninjured. And, uh, <coughs> He was uh, hidden by the French Resistance, and he lived there for a few months, and then he was smuggled back to England uh, by the Royal Navy, by submarine. And um, they said, we want you to stay dead so we can use you for certain things. Um, and, um, and so he said, but what about my wife? And they said, look, we need you to be this way. And so his wife didn't hear from him for a year. You know, she had the missing in action. And then after a year, she gets a telegram from England, and it says, Dear Annette, just back from the most fabulous vacation on the continent. <laughs> uh, love, Bert. And, um, and uh, so this book is based on, on really what happened to him after he was shot down. And also, um, you know, I feel like everything that, if you write too, it's not for entertainment, it's not for escapism. I mean, why would I want to pass the time? Like, I have limited time. So the books that I write, I feel like, same as Luke, actually, from when I read his, is that they give one the experience of going deeper into life, not escaping from life. Um, so, they might be a little bit um, challenging sometimes, uh, but they're challenging to write, too. Um, and this is, uh, this is um, from um, John. Well, his name wasn't John. It was, uh, John awoke in a stew of mud and dead leaves with a fierce pain in his foot. Actually, I'm not going to read this part. Uh, I'm going to read the part where he's on Coney Island. You like Coney Island? I'll spend it. Um, Yeah, you have something to say? Sure. <laughs> well, Simon finds the passage. Thanks, though. Thank you. The Ferris wheel turned slower than normal, so girls could kiss their soldiers goodbye. Stand still, Harriet, or it's not going to work. John's father had given him a camera. It's too windy, she cried. John put the camera down and went over to her. Look, I really want a picture of you on the boardwalk, he said. It would mean a lot to me. She pressed her lips against his and pulled his hair. Don't go, she said. Don't go? I don't want you to go. Why don't go? I can't come back. Don't go, she said. They sat on a low wall and looked at the beach. People were lying on towels. It was a hot day. There were bodies in the water. Children eating quietly under canvas umbrellas. Something was happening. Nobody knew where it would end. 
The children who played on John Street wanted to know when their fathers would come home, why their neighbors banged on their doors late at night, why people sat crying in the kitchen with the radio on. When it got late, they held hands and walked to the subway. Can you still take the photo? Harriet asked. She straightened her blouse and adjusted her hair, moved the pins. The thought of his not coming back brought them closer. John steadied his hands and looked through a small hole at the woman in front of him. He'd never loved anyone so much, but it was something he could never admit to her now. It was a truth anchored in his heart so that her pain might be less, so that she might find another, get married again, have children, watch them grow, make their lunches, see them off to school, visit them in college, get old herself, plan retirement, give away all her jewelry to grandchildren, regret nothing, even forget, even forget the boy she was first married to, who took her picture of Coney Island and was blown to bits in his B-24 by NTL aircraft fire over the French coast, escaping possible. The book of their love would be a chapter in her life, a digression that ends in a rain of metal over wet fields. Then a moment before the snap of the shutter, a gust of wind lifted John's hand. Harriet screamed and couldn't stop laughing. Behind her, people on the Ferris wheel and roller coasters were screaming too. You could hear them up and down the floorboard, <coughs> lost forever in that last great afternoon of their life. She died uh, last year at age 99, and uh, my mother-in-law said, she couldn't have made it to 100. <laughs> she would have been on a Smucker's commercial. <laughs> um, but uh, I'd go visit her in a nursing home in Connecticut. It's where we got married, actually, so that she could be there because she couldn't leave. And um, I'd go visit her and sit with her sometimes. And the, one of the last times I saw her, she was looking at this piece of paper shaking her head like this. She's like, I don't know. I just don't know. I thought it was maybe something political. She's just looking at the piece of paper. And she was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I just don't know. And I said, well, can I help? And she said, you decide. And she gave me a piece of paper. And it said, chocolate milk, regular milk. <laughs> um, <laughs> It would take her, you know, when she, when she was in her late 90s, it would take her three hours to get dressed, three hours to get undressed. So by the time she was dressed, it was time to have lunch, and then she'd just get undressed so she could go to bed. But she had a very, very happy life. Um, and uh, when I was in college, when I met Luke, I volunteered briefly at a nursing home. And that really changed me. Because I saw this is what we've become, you know. So, uh, and better to become that than not to exist. So, um, should we open it up for questions? I think we should. Okay. okay. Let's do it. Yes. I'm staring at the book with this. What's the, why was it written like that? It's such an odd way to, to change. So, yeah, the, the initial title was um, named after three of my favorite things um, Camp. Uh, physical therapy and onions, and they had to shorten it. I don't know why they. I don't know why they chopped it up like that exactly. It was the designer. The first book in the series is Iowa, and it's just Iowa and WA. Um, and the next book is called New York, but it is different, right? It's it's a, it's a very odd way. To, I, I think it's the latest fad. I've seen lots of books like that, and I think it's. Uh, it just seems to be what people do now. Yeah. Well, the kosher edition is just hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I... Uh, I was just wondering, what would you... Obviously, you feel very much a sense of place here, though you're thinking of writing books about a sense of place in other places. But it sounds like yours, too. What, what do you think is special about this part of Long Island for writers, besides, I mean, you kind of reference the ocean, the space, but any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the Hamptons is very, very special because it's, um, it's a blend of 
natural beauty, uh, artistic, creative people, and money. And those things, I think, cohabit in a way where they feed off each other. Because if you paint, you need people to buy your paintings in order to paint more. Um, and so, I, sorry. So it wasn't that in the 50s and, and artists came out. Oh, it was wasn't, different. Oh, it was very different. Uh, the money was very different. And you didn't have big mansions. And you, you just, it was just completely different, but artists. Maybe it's the light. I've heard that the, the way that the light is conducive to painting, such as the light in parts of the Netherlands. You know. I, I like it because it's the country. Coming from Iowa, for me, I always felt like this was the country. It's the coast, but it's wild and it's raw, and there are these uncontrollable forces. These are things that poets need to feel uh, connected, I think, to a place. And I could never identify with a city like I could identify with the country, or the stars, or the ocean. So for me, it was the fact that there, you have nature around you. It's well preserved. There are laws and, and place and rules about building and such. Um, there's a finality, a sense like, well, there's nowhere else to go. If you keep going, you're going to die. You're going to go right off into the ocean. So for me, there's this climate of finiteness, but at the same time, um, Walt Whitman was one of my favorite poets growing up. It felt like the center of poetry for me. It was like everything came out of Whitman's big vision and grand scale, and an open armed love of people and humanity. And I thought, well, I think if that comes from Long Island, if that comes from the Hamptons, I want to experience that. And um, and so you get that dilation out here as a as a poet. You, know, you can really imagine anything you want. You can imagine again. I think. Because of the landscape, there's only so far you can go physically. So you can take that extra step imaginatively or artistically. And I think, as a poet, and I call myself an artist as well, being in a place where there's a threat, you know, the ocean could sue us. Um, it's precarious, you're vulnerable. You're, we're out here, we're really out here. So, but it feels real and immediate. So I think it's, it's a living space. And then what, to, what Simon said, then you get the influx of community, maybe affluence, um, maybe there's isolation, but you're right up the road in the city. So, so many accomplishments, so many forces. Yeah, there are a lot of rules here, though. <laughs> um, like, I know in East Hampton you can't hang your washing out. It's nice to have, nice to have washing that the wind is, you know? You know? Um, <laughs> so a lot of rules. But I suppose also there are rules that mean we can't have very, very ugly buildings. Well, that Scottish restaurant, McDonald's. Um, uh, the, when we moved, well, when we lived here, um, it was very different. It was real a time of excess. It's supposed to be in the 2000s. Yeah, nightclubs everywhere, like uh, drunk people rolling around in King Colour. Um, you know, on Dune Road, it was just these sort of oil rig nightclubs where people would inflate their muscles and then, like, kind of walk around and like, uh, you know, just guzzling beer. Yeah, that's you could have drowned in beer if you'd fallen over. Um, and I think that's changed a lot since then. It's, it's, I really would have liked to have experienced it in the 1960s, but also the 1760s, before that old misunderstanding of a tea. Um, you know, <laughs> in Sag Harbor in East Hampton, you can see evidence of the 18th century, the 1770 house. And the, I met a chap called Hugh King, who is right out of Charles Dickens. If you ever go to the uh, East Hampton Historical Society, he's one of my new heroes. And uh, he does graveyard tours uh, by candlelight. So uh, no cell phones. He's, um, so I really feel you get a sense of history out here, where you don't the rest of the island. Um, yeah. Anybody else with the questions? We still have a couple minutes. Yeah, um, your characters in the book that you were reading from obviously are based on people you know, but do you interview them all, or how do you get so much into the detail? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, yeah, I started to base, uh, I think, characters on people one knows, because it's harder to make them up from scratch. Right. 
Um, and um, when I interview all the writers for magazines, they usually ask them this question, and they say, yeah, 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 basically people I know. Um, and so, uh, but then, I can't know them so well as their personality rules the book. So it has to be people I know sort of medium well. Actually, maybe you'd be great characters <laughs> in the future. Um, and then, just so there's a certain amount of malleability. So, for instance, my wife's late grandfather is perfect, because I knew him through other people's stories of him. Um, and, uh, and also, I, I saw his, I've seen his thumbprint in wine on the, the book you know, during Seder from turning the pages. So I've seen his giant fingerprint on the page. Um, that's a very intimate thing to see, somebody's thumbprint. Like the caves, ancient caves of Vildmanishlok, you know, where our ancestors would put their hands, you know, uh, in paint. And, you know, it's all, I suppose, early photographs. So when your child was eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, you know, you could go to the back of the cave and put your hand on their handprint and remember you know, the time you had together. So, um, yeah, that's, that's how it's done. A good question, yeah. How did you come to write children's books? Um, well, the honest answer is that um, one of my novels got orphaned. And that means in, in publishing, when um, you have an editor at a publishing house and uh, the editor leaves or gets fired right before the book comes out. So then the book gets inherited by a new editor who didn't buy it so they don't have to do anything with it. They just have to make sure, you know, uh, it gets shipped. <clears throat> uh, and so because of that, the book didn't sell at all. Well, that's what I tell myself. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I realized my next book, a year from now, I wasn't going to be able to sell it for a lot of money. Because you know, in modern publishing, you know, things are based on previous sales. Um, it's not the same model it was in the 50s and 60s. Um, and so I thought, well, I better I have a mortgage to pay, I'd better think of something. So I started writing children's fiction. Different genre. And how did you find that interesting? Word? Wonderful. It's not many jobs where you can go into a meeting and argue that the mouse needs to have a bicycle and not a unicycle. <laughs> <laughs> Country. I'm sorry? The country. The country. I said that once to some children, <laughs> and they went. <were laughs> <laughs> <laughs> Where did you spend more time in London? Then in Wales? Wales. Yeah, from the animals. Huh? Yeah, from the animals. You don't sound like Dylan Thomas or Evelyn Williams. Yeah, that's true. Well, they beat her out of you in school. <laughs> Oh, in Wales? Yes. In, in, yeah, that was... Um, and, but, and then you came here, how, how did that happen? You, you said you were at university, and I presume that was Wales, isn't it? Yeah, it was. Uh, I, uh, I came here because I was living in Greece, country, not the substance. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, I was watching, uh, I saw a Woody Allen film, because I get together with somebody who was from Britain, you know, to commiserate, living in Greece. And uh, we'd watch American films and British films. And then I saw Annie Hall, I think it was. And then the next week we saw Manhattan. And I said, who are those people? She said, oh, they're New York Jews. I said, I like them. <laughs> so I applied to go to graduate school in New York. And I got completely rejected by everyone. And the next year I applied again and got in. And that's how I came here. And he was living in... Iowa, but I thought he was living in, in uh, near the equator, because he wrote me a letter that said, I'm in love with Africa, but he meant a person. I thought he meant a place. I was like, what's he doing there? Uh, a, a little bit of trivia. The, the beach scene of the Annie Hall was actually filmed in South Hampton Village. Really? Yes, I was able to watch what kind of the beach. Yeah. Um, oh, really? That's amazing. Yeah. And it's probably changed a lot since then. Has it, Southampton? Since yes. The yes. Actually, when I grew up here in the 50s. Uh, um, no. Well, I mean, I was born in 1948, so when we were kids, we did. We grew up on Main, on, Main, on South Main Street. So when we would uh, walk to town, 
we would take note of people that we did not know. In other words, it was entirely different. Now, there was a summer population for three months of the year. People went, you know, Palm Beach, Southampton, and so forth, but that was it. It was farmers and small business people. That was the population, and, and you really literally knew everyone. So it's changed a lot since then. Even in the 70s, in the, win Even in the, in the winter time, yeah. you could meet this. The street we lived on, we were the only people there. My husband and I just wanted to say that once we went to the A&P to talk to the checkout lady. Literally, there was nobody. Everything was shut down. Most of the stores, most of all the restaurants, except the five and ten, which doesn't exist. And the market store, I feel that in Lot and Children's. Still a nice place to be. Very much so. And you can mind with us. I want to thank you both. Thanks, it's been such an enjoyable hour, and um, really glad that you were all here for it, and want to have you both back. In fact, we will definitely be seeing uh, Simon before in, in 2020 because on, on February 12th he will be talking, doing a little program called "The Way We Love," in which he's exploring the many forms of love through the ages with the selection of poems and philosophy and fiction, and so I do hope you'll be around for that. Not my fiction, so you can relax. <laughs> uh. And we'd love to have this back as well. So thank you both again. Thank, thank, you, thank you all for being here.